I was uh, shortlisted for the uh, Canadian astronaut uh, process that we just went through here in Canada. Um, but before that, I was part of a Mars simulation uh, that was eight months long and took place in Hawaii, funded by NASA. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today. Uh, you can see the Hawaii Space Analog, Space Exploration Analog and Simulation here on the screen. Um, our home is there in the lower right, and we there were six of us living in that dome for eight months. <laughs> so we'll cover the mission objectives. Why did NASA lock six of us away for eight months on the side of a volcano in Hawaii? Um, what it's like to live on Mars, how they made us believe we were living on Mars. Uh, some of the challenges that we faced in there, um, for example, what it was like running out of gas on Mars, uh, the hardest parts of the mission, the best parts, uh, and what we've learned so far, hopefully, from this mission about teamwork and leadership and accomplishing tasks together. So long story short, NASA wants to know how you pick a team and support a team for these long duration, isolated missions without them going crazy and like killing each other. So how do you pick a team that can perform under these extreme circumstances? So this is primarily a psycho psychology experiment for NASA. Um, and we were the guinea pigs. The crew selection process as a result was quite intense. It took about a year um, between applying and finding out whether we would be part of the crew that would be going into this mission. It started with a written application, cover letter, resume, as you would expect, and a research proposal for what you would like to study while you were in, in the dome. So everyone came in with their own research project as well. Then there was an online aptitude test. Um, and it would ask you, there was like logic questions, math, science, stuff like that, but also questions like in this kind of a conflict situation, how would you deal with it? Uh, what kind of qualities do you think make up a good leader? So from a pool of about 750 applicants, uh, after there were these tests, some Skype interviews, some group Skype interviews, they selected eight of us to come on a six-day backpacking trip in the Rocky Mountains in Wyoming with the National Outdoor Leadership School. So this is not your typical job application. Um, so like many Canadians, I thought, you know, this is, if, even if I don't make it, this is amazing. It's an all paid trip, six days camping. I've done a lot of backpacking and camping and stuff uh, growing up in Canada. Uh, so for me, I wasn't really expecting to learn too much from this process. Um, and it was very easy in camping, but it, as, it, as the name implies, it's also a leadership course. So we would do about three to four miles of hiking each day, um, finish up about two in the afternoon, and then we would do debriefs, and then we would do some kind of like training course in the afternoon. The training covered all sorts of things like, um, for example, in a, in a conflict situation, how do you deal with it? And there, it turns out like there's no really right way to do that. You can do, they, they, we went over things from like feather to hammer approaches. So, you know, in a situation maybe where the colleague that you're sharing a, a space with is a little bit smelly, how do you deal with that? <laughs> like, sorry, you can, uh, you can remove yourself from the area as a very, you know, maybe not get too close. These are very, very gentle feather approaches. Maybe you give them a gift of some soap one day, like, hey, I just went to Lush and I got this free sample. Would you like it? And maybe they'll try it out. And maybe, you know, none of your hints or anything is working and eventually you have to be like, okay, you need to go take a shower. This is too much. Like, you know, you bike to work, we have showers at work, you can just go do it. <laughs> Something like that. So there's, there's not always like a right way to do it and there's a whole um, uh, different ways of doing this. Uh, another thing that we did is you guys have probably seen um, these kind of personality charts before. So I've seen this, like, uh, this, is, this is mine. I went online and did it again. I've got a fairly round personality, I guess. Um, a little bit more to one quadrant, but kind of like in the middle for a lot of traits. It turns out that leadership is also one of those things that there's no really right way to do it. Everyone kind of has their style. So over these, this um, six-day um, backpacking course, we found out there are very like extroverted, rah, rah, we're going to go to the moon together and it's going to be amazing, like Elon Musk type of leaders who are very strong and passionate about what they do and you want to go follow them. Um, you also find out that university professors are maybe down in that thinking, introverted quadrant, more cautious and thoughtful, but those are, that's also a very valid leadership style for what they're trying to do. Um, 
my leadership style, turns out, is more leading from behind. I never thought of myself as a very strong leader uh, because I'm more of just like a see how the team is doing, help out people who are struggling, and we'll all get to the goal at the end of the day together. Um, and then I learned that that's actually a valid leadership style. Not only that, in this kind of isolated situation with this group of highly talented people, maybe that's actually the leadership style that you want for this kind of a mission. You don't want to be micromanaged for eight months by anyone. You don't want someone telling you what to do, especially when these are all very highly talented people who have a lot of like master's degrees, PhD degrees, who are very good at what they do. They don't need you to tell them what to do all the time. So by the end of this week, um, not only was I feeling that perhaps I was qualified for this mission, that maybe I actually was the right person to command the mission as well. At the end of the week, we had a very short survey uh, basically, who would you like to see as the commander of your mission, and who would you kick off the island? Is there someone after this week that you really could not handle living with for eight months? And uh, I was offered the command position after that week. So this is just the whole group of us um, that went. As I said, there was only eight of us vying for the high seas position, um, but there's a lot more in this picture. That's because NASA had an astronaut class taking part at the same time on their, on their own mission. So in the front row, second from the right, you see NASA astronaut Sunita Williams, who is uh, keeping an eye on all the NASA astronaut candidates. So NASA really was taking this experiment seriously. They are really looking for data on how you pick a team and support a team for these long duration missions. And this is the final high seas crew that was selected. Um, I was the only Canadian. Everyone else there is American. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't look too diverse on the surface, but um, you can see me on the one end. I was chosen as the commander, and I have a background in mechanical engineering and a PhD in photovoltaic engineering, so solar, solar cell manufacturing. Um, Alan Mirkadirov sitting next to me, he is actually originally from Azerbaijan, Russia, uh, moved to the States when he was about 16. So he was our, our token Russian on the crew. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he, and he has a degree in, in physics and works for uh, NASA Goddard and is also um, an officer in the Air Force, the US Air Force. Jocelyn Dunn was working on her PhD in uh, like behavioral systems, uh, so like systems engineering, but as it relates to human behavior. And she was actually working on stress, monitoring stress in isolated environments. Zach and Sophie were both engineers, uh, mechanical engineers, but Zach's expertise was in materials, Sophie's in robotics. And Neil Scheibelhut was our biologist, also a medic from the US Army who'd been in Iraq for a few years as well. So he was our, our crew medical officer. So we had a pretty diverse but technical set of backgrounds on the crew, but also very diverse personalities on the crew. Uh, Zach, I would say, is probably the shyest person I've ever met in my entire life. Very, very quiet, introverted. Um, Sophie and Neil were very, very outgoing. This was also really good. If you think that for these like long duration isolated missions, you maybe want more introverted people, but if everyone on the crew was very introverted, your idea of a good night might be just like hanging out in your room, watching a season of Archer by yourself or something. And it would be a very silent, isolating mission. Uh, maybe kind of depressing. Um, but if everyone was super exuberant and outgoing, you can see the personalities would be clashing off each other. People would have different opinions on what the best thing to do was, and there'd probably be a lot of conflict. So actually having a diversity of personalities and backgrounds on the crew uh, was just as important as all the very having a diversity of technical abilities on the crew. So as I said, we were the guinea pigs in NASA's experiment. And one of the things they're looking for is um, these stress and depression models. Um, you're never going to pick a crew that's perfect, who's never going to have conflict, people who are never going to get depressed. These are just normal things. And they happen in just about every team. Uh, and they see these behavioral patterns or, or stress patterns show up in all sorts of isolated extreme environments. So whether it's like a mission in Antarctica, uh, space missions nowadays, submarine crews. Uh, at the start of the mission, everything is very happy, um, exciting. You're doing new work in a new environment. It's very exciting. So people are very you know, happy and excited to be there. Um, about halfway through the mission, that starts to change. 
things become routine, things are boring, you haven't seen new people or new places for a long time, uh, the work is routine, uh, and people start to get depressed. There's still a long way to go. So you can see in both models, around the halfway point, uh, things start to go down. Uh, in the Bechtel third quarter model, it's like once you kind of push through that third quarter, People start to get happy again. They're excited. They're wrapping up the research. They're you know, going to go home and see their family still and soon, and, and things start to get brighter again. Um, in the ROAR model, the heightened alertness, depression, volatility, the, that you are excited towards getting it towards the end, um, but your workload starts to increase. Your priorities may start to change, and it's not just excitement and happiness. It's also just like stress and conflict. So it's a period of great volatility. It can be a period of great volatility in the crew. Uh, for us, um, we got through three quarters of the mission very, very happy together um, with very minimal conflict. So we were, we were very excited and proud of ourselves. We were like, yes, we're going to be the first crew that doesn't get third quarter syndrome. NASA's going to learn so much from us about what, you know, how to pick a crew. And then almost to the day when there was one quarter left in the mission, you could almost see like a switch flip in some people's minds and priorities started to shift and we had a lot of conflict. Um, we had been meeting about once a week to kind of like debrief, go over the week, how things went, how, what we have to do the next week. Um, at, in the last quarter, communication started to break down and we ended up having, like we, people didn't want to have dinner together anymore. So, in, that, and that was a natural time when we would all chat. So we had to start instituting daily meetings just to make sure everyone was getting what they needed out of the mission. So we actually had to change our, a lot of our social and communication structures to get through that last period. So NASA was working with six different research, uh, research groups across the United States um, to study us and our behaviors. Um, one was a journal study where we would, you know, write, they wouldn't really read them, but they would put the, our journals through uh, a computer algorithm to look at words that were either positive or negative or, or indicate, you know, stress or happiness. Um, MSU, Michigan State University, had us wearing badges that monitored how close we were to each other, um, volume levels, light levels, so they could see who was interacting. And then there were also three to four surveys a day, just quick ones saying, who did you last interact with? Was it positive or negative? Was it work-related or social? Um, there was a team performance challenge on Tuesdays and Thursdays where we you know, were in different groups and we'd play a little computer game. Uh, there was a virtual space station, which was like a kind of like the doctor from Star Trek Voyager, like kind of like they're trying to work towards like a virtual psychologist that you could talk things through th with. Um, cognition, I will get you guys to try it in a minute. And then there was a food study. So the reason that we, they had these very kind of like odd indirect studies is that it turns out astronauts are not very honest people. <laughs> Everyone wants to go to space. So if you ask an astronaut, how are things going? They're never going to say, oh, things are really stressful right now. I don't know if I can handle any more work. They're going to say, no, everything is great. And then NASA's mission support will be like, hey, we have this one other task for this other research group. Do you think you can handle it? They'll say, yes, of course I can handle it. Uh, and so things will be great, 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 great until all of a sudden they're not great. So by asking these kind of indirect questions or using the badge to monitor who's interacting, they can kind of see if someone's isolating themselves um, and, or detect when there's, by looking at the journals and looking for positive or negative words that you might not even consciously be putting in there, um, they can hopefully see warning signs for depression or conflict without having to directly ask. And then maybe they can find a way of supporting that or you know, maybe you know, lay off some of the tasks or organize something fun or give them some kind of happy surprise um, to sort of lighten the situation. Um, so I will get you guys to do one of the cognition tests. We would do this every Friday, um, every other Friday. And this was, yeah, well, there would be like a series of, of 10 questions kind of like this. So you guys, I'll give you a minute. You have to pick out which of the blocks at the bottom fits into the question mark spot there. I'll give you a minute, then we'll do a show of hands. Who thinks it's number one? Who thinks it's number two? Number three? Number four? Number five? It's number two. Yeah. So if you look at like the, um, 
at the very, very center blocks going across the rows, all, all the colors are the same. If you kind of look at the middle ring going down the columns, all the, all the colors the same. And then if you go on the outside rings on the diagonal, all the colors are the same. So we would get these, a series of like 10 questions like this um, every Friday, and you got marked on like your accuracy and uh, the speed with which you got the answers. And the goal was to see like over the time, over the eight months of the mission, do you go through periods where your reactions are slower, where you're not as sharp anymore? Is that because you've been indoors for six months and haven't had a chance to go outside and get fresh air? Or is it because you're extremely under stress from workloads? Um, it's, you, you don't know, you, don't, you may not know it yourself, but when you do this test all the time, you can see if you're like slipping over time. Um, and actual astronauts do these kind of tests before they go out and do something critical, like a spacewalk, where their life could be in danger. So it'd be like, before you get in your car in the morning, you would have to do this test to see if you're sharp enough to drive down the 401 today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but to see, you know, they, they need to put us under the stress that simulates what it would actually be like on Mars um, for these, these results to have some sort of meaning for them, if we're going through the same stress that an astronaut would be going through. So what is Mars like? It's got only 38% of Earth's gravity, for one. Um, unfortunately, we can't simulate gravity yet. We haven't figured out how to fake that yet. Um, but we did have to do things that astronauts would do to mitigate the effects of gravity, such as like working out for an hour and a half to two hours every day. So starting from our second day in the dome, we started doing the P90X videos, and we ended up doing like P90X, P90X2, P90X3, um, Sean T stuff, uh, and worked out like every single day for eight months. So that, that was fantastic. Um, there's no magnetic field, uh, very little atmosphere. What atmosphere there is is CO2. And the temperatures can vary between minus 143 degrees uh, Celsius and 35 degrees. Uh, so the environment's quite harsh. You're going to have to be protected all the time, either in a, in a spacesuit or in your habitat. So you can't go outside for those whole eight months. Anytime you do, you have to be in a spacesuit. Uh, there's very little water on Mars. What water there is is contaminated with weird salts like perchlorates and things. And the rock is volcanic. So I have another question for you guys. Um, one of these photos is from Earth and one is from Mars. So who thinks the one on the left is Mars? And who thinks the one on the right is Mars? Yeah. So what, they, they do look very similar and one, one of the photos was taken right outside the habitat where they had us living. So again, you can see uh, the habitat on, on Mauna Loa in Hawaii. So it's 8,000 feet up the mountain. Uh, it is a live volcano. Uh, there's no vegetation as far as you can see. Uh, the, there's no habitat, like there's no other humans living as far as you can see. Um, and we are living entirely off-grid on solar energy with um, batteries to last us through the night, hydrogen fuel cells as a backup power, and then um, gasoline generator as a, as a backup for the backup. They could simulate the distance between Earth and Mars as well. Um, Earth and Mars are so far apart that it takes 20 minutes for a message to get from Earth to Mars, and then 20 minutes for a reply to come back. So there's no live communication, no phone calls, no Skype, uh, no internet. The internet does not work on that kind of a delay. So all we had was email on a 20 minute delay each way. So you say, hey, how's it going? And then you wait 40 minutes and then you get an answer. <laughs> so yeah, the crew has to be quite autonomous and able to deal with uh, situations as they arise. As, as I said, we were on solar power. We also had restricted water. Um, you would bring a lot of the water that you need with you and just recycle it over and over. We didn't have recycling facilities for the water. We just had these two tanks that fit about 1,000 gallons of water. And that would last us about a month, three weeks to a month. Uh, which meant also that we had, we had composting toilets. Our toilets were not normal, they didn't flush. And it, each crew member would get about six minutes of shower time a week. Uh, so you really kind of, you, you conserve that for the cardio days. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, you can see one of the spacesuits that uh, a fellow was out to do the water measurement test. 
Um, this was another one of the spacesuits that we had. One of them, it, it weighed about 60 pounds, uh, had a battery, a cooling pack with water that would pump chilled water through a vest, a fan to force air into the, into the um, helmet so you could breathe, you would get fresh air. And yeah, it weighed 60 pounds, so it, it, which is about what they're estimating would be the equ equivalent weight of a spacesuit on Mars. Um, so you're out there hiking over rough terrain, um, trying to you know, collect rock samples in, in this really heavy, hot, awkward suit as well. All the food has to be shelf stable. An actual Mars mission would be three years long, so all of our food had to last three years. So everything was freeze-dried or dehydrated, um, like prepared dehydrated meals, or uh, we'd make meals from scratch. Uh, and all the workouts were indoors, as I said. Uh, lots of P90X videos. You can't really go around playing soccer or basketball or go out for a bike ride. Um, so the theme of your conference is, I think, failure and resilience in um, municipal and government uh, situations. So I was going to talk about a few... People often ask me, what was the most challenging thing you faced in the Dome? So it kind of falls into two categories. Some are technical challenges, and some are the social challenges. So in terms of technical challenges, like what do we mean by failure in engineering? Um, so engineering is it's inherently dangerous, but not always for the engineer, um, usually to the people that you're designing or engineering the things for. Uh, so you can see in the bottom, we've got the examples of the bridge in Quebec um, that they were building this bridge over the St. Lawrence. And it collapsed, and when they did the, uh, I guess, forensic autopsy or whatever they do on it, they discovered that it was an a engineering design mistake. And like 200 people were killed as a result of this. And that's when, um, in Canada, we decided that engineers should be reminded of the importance of their work. And they created the Iron Ring and the Iron Ring Ceremony. Um, legend has it that the, the rings were made from the bridge that broke I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it, does, it is a reminder that when you're working, people's lives are depending on you to do it correctly. Um, another you know, famous engineering mistake or disaster was the shuttle um, explosion, both Challenger and Columbia now, um, <coughs> which the, the Challenger one was an, an O-ring that failed. Um, and the engineers did warn that it was too cold um, for the shuttle to lift off that it was outside the specs of the, the material specs and the uh, management decided to launch it anyways and it failed and caused loss of life and mission and everything. So th like when, when there's failures in engineering, it can be very, very devastating. We had one, I guess, big unexpected technical challenge on, on our Mars simulation. Um, as I said, we are entirely on solar power. So we're very dependent on the weather. Um, for all our power needs. We had one week where it's like, I think like there was hurricanes coming through. We had very limited um, sunlight all week. We, we, we weren't charging the batteries up past 30% on, on the sun, sunlight. So um, we had you know, hydrogen backup, we have gasoline backup, but we don't know when we can get resupplies of those. Those have to last us, you know, it could have to last us a month. So we start with like mitigation me measures, like let's reduce the amount of energy we need. We, we would always joke that when it's dark and cold outside, we can't have light or heat because it takes too much energy uh, for the solar panels. But so we couldn't cook all that week. We're you know having dried fruit and nuts and cereal bars, um, no 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 hot food. The heat we basically turned off as much as we could. We reduced all our experiments pretty much down to like only doing the NASA surveys. We reduced the lighting, so we were doing we couldn't. Um, we were doing things like in the dark most of the time. And we would do low energy entertainment or workouts like, like board games or cards or you know, playing the guitar, um, stuff like that, no, no movies. Um, and then you know, we'd been doing this for a week and then we had a critical malfunction. Um, it didn't even matter that we had backup fuel anymore because our generator developed an issue. Um, and we didn't know what it was, we just knew that it wasn't charging the batteries anymore. So we... Um, Quickly, we turned off the generator because we weren't getting any power out of it. And we had to uh, come up with a way of maintaining our critical systems, maintaining power to our critical systems, um, and uh, make our, our fuel last until we could get help from the outside world. This was, a, this was a problem that we couldn't fix on our own. 
Um, so we quickly, we were like, okay, well, what are our cr critical systems? The toilets, we decided, were a critical system. Uh, they had fans to remove the odors out the roof and some heaters to keep the microbes alive. It's a, they're composting to toilets, so we need the microbes to keep composting the stuff. So we're like, okay, that's a critical system. We don't want to be in the hab with the toilets. The lab freezer, we've been collecting urine samples, saliva samples, feces samples from eight months, you know, six to eight months of our, our mission for NASA. We can't have those freezers um, go down. We need, we need, those are the, like, samples are like people's PhD research. Like, we have, we have to save the samples. Uh, we needed to maintain communications so that our mission support would know what's going on. And blast off McRocket Boots was our, um, our fish in our aquaponics setup. So we're like, no, we need, we need blast off to be safe as well. So those were our, our critical systems. Um, so it, it, when, when this crisis happened, I was actually really proud of our team because everyone fell into their roles of solving all of the problems with very little direction from me. Sophie and Neil suited up in the suits to go and troubleshoot the um, generator outside. Zach and I were working on the technical uh, troubleshooting inside. And then Alan and Joss were going around turning things off around the habitat, and Joss was maintaining communications uh, with the mission support. Um, Eventually, we uh, were able to bypass our batteries by running extension cords directly from the generator um, to a power bar in the habitat where we could power our four critical life support systems. And, um, and we just were able to run the hydrogen fuel cells to the batteries to maintain the communications. And uh, about 24 hours later, someone was able to come up and fix the generator. But I was very proud that you, know, you, you kind of you, you prepare and you practice for these kind of things. So when actual disaster kind of strikes, everything, you know, everyone knows their job, everyone knows what to do, and things happen smoothly. Um, and so I was very proud, actually. So this was actually a really fun technical challenge for us because it was unexpected, and we, you know, we met it. If this had, met, if this had happened on actual Mars, you know, the stakes would be higher. Um, we would probably have died. <laughs> uh, there is no outside help on Mars. Um, but here, like, our worst case scenario is uh, you know, the toilets stink up the hab for a few days. So the, the, maybe the stress isn't quite at the level that it would be on actual Mars, but it was very um, satisfying to come up with a solution on our own without the help of uh, the outside people. And having a good sense of humor also helps a lot. So I don't even know if you can see, but this was a photo taken when we had, <laughs> were mitigating all these things with the lights out, everything is dark. Uh, and Sophie is over there doing uh, hand puppets for the mission video explaining what's going on. So there's a little dog shadows happening in the background there. <laughs> so the other hardest part is the conflict management. So there's the technical challenges, but then there's also the human challenges. And if the human systems break down, it can be just as catastrophic as if an actual mechanical system breaks down. What was very interesting to see was how the types of conflicts evolved over the course of the mission. Uh, at the start of the mission, um, we had, you know, like just normal sort of you're living with new roommate kind of problems. Um, one example was like, you know, we'd forgot to put vacuuming on the cleanup schedule. And so one person was like vacuuming all the time or cleaning the floors all the time. And she just got sick of it. And she's like, ah, I can't do this anymore. So we made up a roster for it. Um, but so those are like very, very small, like, you know, someone's leaving their dishes in the sink all the time and you get tired of cleaning up after that person. So after a while, like you sort out all these things and things go smoothly. So for the whole middle of the mission, we had almost no conflict because we kind of got these like sort of living situation things, you know, confronted and dealt with early in the mission. Um, and then everything, yeah, everything was going smoothly in the middle. And then, as I said, with one quarter of the mission left, people's priorities kind of switched, and we ended up having a lot of conflict towards the end. One of the things, like, as I said, we didn't have any internet or phone or live communications with anything. And eight months is a long time to spend in isolation. A lot of us had given up jobs, like quit our jobs, given up our apartments and stuff to take part in this mission. And as the end of the mission was coming close, you know, in, you know, you see that, you know, in a month, we're going to have got out, have three days of debrief, and then we're all homeless and unemployed. <laughs> so, and there's nothing you can do to fix that because you can't call anyone, you can't look for jobs online, you can't, you can't do it, you can't, you can't do anything because you don't have the internet, you don't have phones. So, you're very limited in, in what you can do to remedy that situation. 
one of the one major conflict. So yeah, people started worrying about their own issues and priorities rather than the team goals. Um, one of the one very specific example was like one girl was giving a TEDx talk in Italy, like two weeks after getting out of the dome. So she had to practice and um, record her talk and send it to them before the mission or before her talk. Only we're living in this tiny dome. So there's not a lot of space. It's really difficult to be quiet, for everyone to be quiet for 30 minutes at a time so she can get this uh, recording done. So what she ended up doing was just waiting until everyone went to bed at like 10 or 11 at night, and then she would start her recording. She would be up to like three or four in the morning trying to get this recording done and all her practicing. Um, eventually, her entire sleep schedule flipped. So she would wake up at 10 p.m. and go to bed at like eight in the morning, and then we'd have to wake her up whenever we had to do all the team things uh, with, for, for the NASA experiments. Eventually, we, we worked through that, and she got back onto our schedule, but that was just like one example of how one person's priorities would impact everyone else's, or how we were all impacting her um, exit plans, I guess. So yeah, at the end of the mission, we had to, as I said, we had been meeting weekly, um, we had to start meeting daily to maintain communication and, and trust among all the, all the crew members. Some of the most difficult things in there, as you could tell, was lack of privacy. This was our workspace, six of us working pretty much shoulder to shoulder all day, every day. So you have to have very strong social skills, actually, to be in here. Um, you have to be very self-aware. As I said, Zach was the most introverted person I'd ever met in my entire life. And when he was coming out of this experience, he said, this has actually been the most social he'd ever been in his entire life, just because you have someone there with you all day, every day. There is no getting away from anyone. No internet, as I said, was also quite difficult. Um, you don't really think about this uh, anymore, how, how much you, know, you just refer to it all the time. Um, so not being able to look up papers for your research, not being able to look up a part number when you need it. Uh, having to depend on mission support, and if you have to ask twice, have that conversation be two hours, three hours long, maybe spanning over days. Um, it's very difficult to, to, to work on those, those slow timelines. Eventually, they, they would ask us what you missed every day. Often it was like sun or wind on your skin. Um, at one point, I remember just missing YouTube, missing cat videos. It's like, <laughs> it's not something I expected to miss. I, I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> not going outside was also quite difficult. Just like not having the sun or the wind on your skin. It, it, you, you don't, again, you don't really think about it. Once we finished this experiment, I didn't want to be, we finished in June. I didn't want to live inside again until like winter. So I spent the whole summer just like biking and camping and being outside as much as possible. But there was a lot of really positive things um, about living in the dome as well. Uh, one was the group workouts, as I said. I was really worried, like being a very active person, enjoying hiking and camping and sports, that I would lose a lot of my fitness being in the dome. But since we did workouts every single day, I actually ended up being in the best physical shape that I'd ever been in in my entire life. Uh, one of my you know, goals had been to do a pull-up. I'd never been able to do a pull-up in my life. And after, you know, three rounds of P90X, I was finally able to do a pull-up for the first time in my life, just one. But I was like, okay, I am physically capable of this. So that was really, really great. The food was also surprisingly good. Um, despite it being all freeze-dried, shelf-stable foods for, um, that have to last you for three years, um, people got very, very creative. We broke up the, the kind of like work schedule in that each person would only have to cook dinner once a week. We'd do like a family dinner every night. And since everyone only had to cook once a week and we're all very competitive, <laughs> everyone would kind of go all out and make their favorite dishes. So you can see our, um, our Thanksgiving meal on the left there. Um, Joss and I making um, Vietnamese spring rolls out of some of the stuff we made in our indoor garden and uh, tofu and things. And then on the bottom right, we'd been craving burgers. And after about four months in the dome, we finally figured out how to make a proper-ish burger <laughs> by throwing the, de like the freeze-dried meat in a blender, turning it to powder, mixing it with the um, powdered egg crystal, turning it, like hydrating it into a patty, frying it. Um, 
so this, uh, we had to make the buns from scratch. Zach made like these sesame seed rolls. This whole meal took him 18 hours to make, I think. So it, it spanned two days. But it was the best thing that we ate. And we had like leftovers for three days. And every time I bit into it, I would smile. So people really, really put a lot of effort into the food. Um, one of the other reasons is there's not a lot of good things, good surprises that can happen in the dome. Um, out in the real world, you know, you go grocery shopping, you run into someone you haven't met in a long time, you go for coffee, there's a new movie coming out. Like, none of that happens in the dome. Um, so the only real gift or surprise you can give to each other is, is stuff that we would create through food often. The people were fantastic. Uh, despite all the conflict that we had at the end, um, I think they picked a really fun, high-quality crew. Um, and... Uh, sorry, for me, like my goal was, I guess for me, the mission success would be if, um, if NASA gets what they need out of the mission and we all come out still being friends, because I figured this could go one of two ways. Either we'll all hate each other forever or we'll all be like best friends forever. There's like no middle ground here. Um, if we all come out still being friends, then for me, that was a mission success. Uh, and we did still come out all being friends and we do, all, all, all of us still talk to each other and we'll all um, try to make plans to meet up and stuff. So for me, that was a real success. We were the first crew to be in there for all of the holidays. We went in um, like mid-October and training work week was during Canadian Thanksgiving. So we were Canadian Thanksgiving, Halloween, uh, American Thanksgiving, Christmas, Russian Orthodox Christmas, uh, Chinese New Year. We would, we would celebrate everything, whether it was our holiday or not, because again, you don't get a lot of chances to you know, have happy occasions in the dome. So we would try and make a point of having some kind of celebration every week or two. Um, and they were really great, great people for that. Another really fun thing was just pretending to be an astronaut, getting the spacesuits on, getting training in geology, and getting to do these geology um, tasks that they would set us to go and explore the area, explore lava tubes, analyze rock samples, write reports, and send them back to NASA, um, just as they would have real astronauts to do. So that was a really fun aspect of the mission as well. And for me, being a renewable energy and sustainability engineer, I really enjoyed living on uh, renewable energy for eight months and, and sharing my knowledge with the, the rest of the crew and showing them really how easy it can be. Um, I think people were pretty amazed at how easy it was, actually. Uh, there was a few things. We didn't have a lot of um, battery storage, so we had had to change a few of our habits. For example, we couldn't cook dinner after the sun was down because we didn't have enough energy storage. Um, so people, whoever was on dinner that night, would start cooking dinner around like one or two in the afternoon, wrap up around four, we'd do our, our team workout together, and then we just have to kind of heat up dinner uh, around six or seven when we were ready to eat. So we had to, you know, shift high energy intensive tasks to when we had sunlight, um, but actually that was quite easy and, and really quite pleasant. People were surprised how with very minimal adjustments they could, they could live easily on renewable energy. So what NASA's has learned um, from this so far, and what we learned, was that when you're picking a crew, it takes all types, not just in terms of technical background, but also in terms of personalities. The importance of work-life balance. We think that we made it as far into the mission without serious conflict because we were able to you know, take the time out to you know, have, have those parties, or um, we tried to keep like a regular eight to five work week and then have the weekends more open for social activities or if we wanted to do out outreach with schools um, around the country or something, we could do that on, on our own time on the weekends. So maintaining that work-life balance was we were able to like, de-stress. Um, compromise, tolerance, and a sense of humor will get you through most situations. So just being open-minded and not taking yourself too seriously um, and you know, being able to make fun of yourself really helps as well. We think that NASA learned a lot about what makes up a successful crew. We were, um, we were the middle part, actually, of a three-part study. So they were, there was a four-month crew, we were the eight-month crew, and then they had a crew in for a, a whole year after us. Um, they finished up last June, so the, the results are just starting to come out now. Um, and we'll get to see a bit more about what, what NASA's learned about picking a crew and teamwork and leadership from all of this. Yeah, and I learned a lot about how off we are from still being truly sustainable. Um, living on renewable energy was actually really, really easy. What was really, really difficult was waste management. Um, even though we were living in a dome, you can't go shopping, you can't bring anything new in there, um, just the way we package foods, the way we do science, the way we use lab supplies, 
Like we would generate a bag or two of trash a week just for six people in this isolated environment. Um, we did some composting that was like my kind of project and we were able to cut a lot of the kitchen waste out. But still, we're like, this is, especially for a Mars mission, if you're thinking like you're throwing out all this stuff, like are you really gonna bring one-time use wrapping or um, lab supplies? Probably not. So uh, we really, if you can't do that in that kind of confined environment, we should, it's not stuff that we should be doing in our normal lives as well. So I know, uh, the waste management aspect of it also surprised me. And I just wanted to finish with a few notes on, on leadership and, and teamwork. Um, so what kind of things it takes to be a leader? Um, it starts really with self-care being able to be self-aware, be able to take care of yourself, whether that's like financially in terms of like cooking dinner, in terms of cleaning up. Um, just being able to take care of yourself is like basically the first step. Once you can take care of yourself, you can start to expand that in taking care of other people. Um, and you, you, you kind of, you, the best way to do that is just to be joining teams or being part of a larger organization and, 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 and contributing. Being a good follower as well is also very important. Um, when people ask you to do something, whether or not you agree with it, just being generally helpful, whether making time for others and, and um, accepting criticism as well. And then the very, very last, I think, portion of being a good leader is the actual leadership qualities. Um, and, and, and that more is like stepping up when people need help, um, being the one to take on tasks that nobody else wants. And, and being, being willing to take on take the responsibility when things fail, whether or not it's your, your fault, not, like not to be, I guess, handing out blame or anything, but being accepting like, yes, this failed, accept the responsibility for it, and then kind of move on and try to make everything better. So those, those are kind of the, the last things I wanted to leave you with. And if you guys have any questions, we should have a bit of time for that now. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.